almost everyone I know that has multiple sclerosis walks a little bit weird. And that weird walking comes from compensations, and a compensation is your brain having figured out a way for you to be able to still do the thing that you need to do. And sometimes it comes up with weird choices, but they are the best choices that your brain has been able to figure out. I have been teaching workshops since 2013 on working with clients with different neurological diseases. And one of the biggest sections that I do is on gait or walking. And in those workshops, I take normal non-neurological clients and I give them foot drop. And the way I do that is I make them wear a snorkel fin. Because if you, like me, have foot drop, you know that it's hard to clear your foot when you're walking. And then you have to come up with some sort of way to still walk. And these are all the different ways that people would come up with this. The different gait abnormalities that I'm going to talk about first are ones that people wearing a snorkel fin will immediately develop, like immediately, put a snorkel fin on, start walking across the room, you are going to walk with one of these different compensations that those of us who have foot drop or weakness in our hip flexors or weakness in the ability to lift our foot also develop. The first one is something called a circumduction gait. And in a circumduction gait, what you do is, let's say this is my foot drop leg, because it is. If I was circumducting my leg when I, would, when I walk, what I would do is I would take a step forward with my non-MS affected leg, and I would swing my leg out and around to the side. And that swinging my leg out and around to the side makes me not have to bend my knee if my leg likes to hyperextend, which is also a problem um, that can happen kind of concurrent with foot drop and with weakness and spasticity. And I just can swing my leg around so I don't have to really flex my foot. So if I have foot drop or a snorkel fin, what I'm going to do is say, like, I need to get that out of the way. When people circumduct their leg, um, what happens is the leg that they're standing on sometimes dips in too much. And my leg doesn't do that, so it's kind of hard for me to mimic it. But it's called a Trendelenburg gait. And a Trendelenburg gait is when you stand on your leg, that's the stance leg when you're walking. It adducts, which means it moves in towards the midline, and then your other leg has even more room to swing to the outside. When people's leg kind of dips in a lot, that indicates that they're weak in their hip muscle. So um, a lot of the stuff that we really focus on is strengthening the muscle of the hips. Now, circumduction would be one thing that my snorkel fin, newly diagnosed foot drop, client would come up with. Another thing would be a steppage gait. And a steppage gait would be where you kind of lift your legs up more than would be kind of a normal thing for you to be able to clear your foot from the floor. So that does require that you have enough strength in your hip flexor to do that. So I would say in terms of my MS clients that I work with, I actually see way more circumducting than I see steppage gait. But my snorkel fin clients don't have a neurological disease in reality, so they might have like a pretty high steppage gait. But even like people with MS, we sometimes develop a steppage gait. Another thing that people can develop um, neurologically when they have, when they have foot drop um, is sort of a backwards lean. And this is actually something I do, especially when I start to get tired is I start to lean backwards. And when you lean backwards, you don't have to like lift your foot up as much, and you don't have to flex your leg at the hip as much. So if you're like me and you're weak in the hip, um, in the hip flexor, but you're also weak in the dorsiflexors, which is what you lift your foot up, a lot of times people are gonna kind of lean backwards. That backwards lean can also be indicative that your eyes don't converge. So your eyes converging is like, um, a vision problem that's common with people with and without neurological diseases. So if I was looking at my finger and I was bringing my finger towards my face, I should see two fingers at some point. I never see two fingers because what my brain has decided to do is just look at my finger with my right hand. 
just turns my left side off completely. But if your eyes don't converge and you're walking, sometimes it's hard to really kind of figure out where you are in space, in which case you kind of lean backwards. So it's like when you get farsighted and you start to hold a menu further away from your face so you can read it. It's a very similar thing. It's just your vision um, trying to create more of a knowledge of where you are in space. So that would be sort of a backwards lean. Um, if people have other kind of issues with neurological disease like MS, they're going to develop you know, any number of other um, weird walking patterns. So one of those could be what's called a scissor gait. So if I have a ton of tightness in my inner thighs and muscle spasticity, and that's one of the most common places where people get it, is in their inner thighs. So if my inner thighs are kind of pulling towards each other, I might walk with my legs coming too close to each other, in which case maybe you untie your shoelaces when you walk. That's something that I do when I start walking and my legs come too close together. Or you might even cross your legs over your other leg. Now, just because you're crossing a leg over another leg does not actually mean you have tightness in your inner thighs. It can actually be caused by tightness in your back. So another place where people get spasticity a lot is in this muscle. This muscle is called your QL or your quadratus lumborum. So if you feel like you're being pulled kind of this way, that can be a muscle spasticity issue here. Now, if you're being pulled this way, what it does is it rotates your pelvis in kind of a strange way where one part of your pelvis, so these are the two halves of your pelvis, is actually a little bit too far forward. And when it's too far forward and you take a step, you're inclined to actually step one leg across the other leg. So the tight side is pulling your leg across, but the not tight side is not pulling the other leg across. So people who have that tend to walk like kind of to the side, you know, if they were sort of walking, they would end up walking into the wall and they have one leg crossing over, but not both legs crossing over. Um, another thing that people have, if they have foot drop or if they just have bad balance and they trip a lot, is we look down because we want to make sure you know that there's nothing on the floor that we could trip on. So if you're looking down all the time when you're walking, you actually are making it harder to lift your legs up and to lift your foot up because I just put my weight forward on my feet, and even if I wasn't like leaning forward but my upper body was forward like this and my head was looking down, it's actually harder for me to lift my legs up. So we look at the Neuro Studio, uh, something we call a four quadrant stability model. So we're looking at the stability of the hips. We're also looking at the stability of, and placement of the shoulders. Because if you can take somebody and get their shoulders to be in the right position and have the head up, which is really hard, and my my head posture is not great because um, I do look down all the time. But if you can look forward and look like about 10 feet in front of you when you're walking so you can still see your potential tripping hazards and you can think about getting your shoulder blades to sit like right on your back, which is going to get your posture um, as best that it can be, you're going to feel a lot lighter when you're walking and that feeling that you're going to like that your heavy goes away, and that heaviness going away is going to make walking a lot easier. Um, another thing that people do when they're afraid of falling is they actually walk really slow. And the slower you walk, the more you feel every single imbalance, because walking is just standing on one leg until you stand on the next leg, until you stand on the next leg. So you're always standing on one leg. So you start to feel really wobbly, and it's actually harder to walk slowly than it is to walk quickly. Um, you also want to look at somebody's arm swing. Um, your arm swing, opposite of what your legs do. So if you are moving your left leg forward, your right arm is moving, and then your left, and then your right, and then your left. So, it's always going to be opposite arm and leg, and that's something called reciprocal arm movement. Reciprocal arm and leg movement. And reciprocal arm and leg movement 
turns on a certain reflex um, called a central pattern generator. And central pattern generators are in your spine. And actually, when you're walking at a, at a fast enough clip, Walking becomes a reflex, and it doesn't actually involve your brain, which is great if your brain and your spinal cord and your muscles don't like to talk to each other. If I get my posture better, if I can think about leading with soft knees and a tall spine, you'll find that walking can become much, much, much easier without necessarily fixing like the foot drop or the spasticity or whatever, even though we're still going to try to work on those things. Sometimes you'll find that you can move better without even tackling them. One other gait problem that people with um, MS might have is something called ataxia. And ataxia indicates that there's a lesion on the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is sort of um, the part of your brain that organizes movement. So you have like the main part of your brain and then you have a little acorn looking part of your brain at the base of it, like right before your brain stem, and that's called your cerebellum. When people have a, a lesion there, they find it really hard to organize their movement. So they tend to walk um, kind of like cowboy-like. So it's like a, it's a wide gait. Um, there are actually some really cool tools for working with ataxia. There's an ataxia vest, um, which can kind of help ground you and make it a little bit easier to move. But um, another sign that you have ataxia is if you slur your speech. Those kind of two things um, are both indicative of ataxia, so the wide gate and the slurred speech.